Grand Teton National Park is one of the most spectacular places to go backpacking in America. And in this video, I'll show you what you need to know to plan your trip. If you like amazing scenery, great camping, and awesome wildlife, the Grand Tetons are a perfect place for you to go backpacking. However, there are some very important things you need to know when planning your trip. First, let's talk about getting a permit. You must have a permit to camp in the backcountry in Grand Teton National Park. If you're able to plan way ahead, you can apply online starting in early January. The cost is $45, and I'll put a link to the website in the description. If you can land a permit for your trip this way, I highly recommend it because it will remove a lot of uncertainty. However, only one third of the available permits are issued this way and they get snapped up pretty quickly. If you want to get an advanced permit, you probably need to be online the day they become available in January. The second option is to get a walk-up permit. If you're like me, you're not sure what you're doing next week, much less six months in advance. So this is the option that I normally take. Walk-up permits are given out one day in advance. This means that if you want to start your trip on a Tuesday, you need to be in line, in person, at the Ranger Center on Monday morning, very early. The Ranger Station opens at 9 o'clock, and you want to get there at least 30 minutes ahead of time, probably much more during the busiest part of the year. The best camping zones are in high demand and go very quickly. Walk-up permits are obtained from one of three Ranger Stations. Moose Visitor Center, Coulter Bay, or Jenny Lake. If you're going to the Moose Visitor Center, you'll see this sign. Take a left and find a spot to park. You'll know you're there when you see the giant moose. Normally you'll be waiting in line outside the building. When it's your turn, enter the building and take a right. There is a gift shop off to the right with a line to the permit area just beyond it. So we're in the ranger station right now getting a permit and this is what it looks like. You get in line and then you talk to one of the rangers and they help you get your trip set up. Once you have your permit in hand, you'll have an entire day to relax before you begin your hike. Later on in this video, I'll share several options for things to do during that day. Next topic, planning your trip. Trip planning is essential when backpacking in the Grand Tetons, and having a good map is really important. My map of choice is this one from National Geographic. It has the topography, the trail maps, the camping zones, it even shows trails outside of the park. You can get it on Amazon for about $11. You'll also want this planning map from the Park Service. You can get it online at their website and I'll provide a link in the description. They also give you one when you get there. Between these two maps, you'll be all set. If you're camping within the park, you'll need to stay within one of 17 designated camping zones. A camping zone is an area along the trail with defined start and end points where you must camp. It's a named area. For example, the Death Canyon zone runs along this area. Each one of these designated zones has a limited number of campsites available. Let's take a look at the Death Canyon camping zone. They'll give you this map if you choose to stay in that zone for a given day. As you can see, there are 15 marked campsites within the zone, plus one for stock and one for group camping. They only give out 12 permits per day for this zone. That helps avoid a mad rush at the end of the day and helps avoid people having to backtrack several miles if all the sites are taken. Designated campsites are on a first come first serve basis within a zone. So if you are late in the day and you pass up a great site, you're taking a bit of a gamble. You do not have to camp in a designated campsite within a zone. However, my experience has been that there are not really many good camping spots other than the designated sites. Designated sites are marked with a sign so you'll be able to see pretty easily where they are. All along here in these camping zones, with marked campsites anyways, you'll see these campsite signs. And then there's a trail that'll go back to the site. Most of the ones, like in Death Canyon, for example, 
are well off the trail, at least 100, 200 feet plus, sometimes more, and they're usually close to a water source. These are really, really nice. Here's another example of a Death Canyon marked campsite. There's the sign. You see the trail going through the woods. You see the site back here. I'll try to zoom in on it slowly. So that one looks like it's, I don't know, 50 yards off the trail or so, which is probably one of the closer ones we've seen here. But they're all not too bad, and you can hear running water down there. The zones themselves are also well marked with the beginning of the zone and the ending of the zone. So you'll know when you're in the zone if you're keeping an eye out for these signs. Okay, now that we've got this zone thing figured out, let's get back to the topic of trip planning. If you're planning a multi-night trip, you'll need to figure out which zone you'd like to camp in each night. Because these campsites are so popular, it can be somewhat difficult to string together a multi-night trip. Fortunately, you do not need a reservation to camp outside the boundaries of the national park. So you can always use an outside the park night as a way to string together a longer trip. I'll use another example to show how this works. Let's say you've planned an awesome three night trip. You plan to hike to Upper Granite Zone and stay there on night one. Then you'll hike to Death Canyon Shelf and stay there on night two and South Fork Cascade on night three. You get there and the ranger tells you that unfortunately your night two camping spot on Death Canyon Shelf is not available. Well, all is not lost. What you can do as an alternative is camp outside the park in Alaska Basin and then continue on with the rest of your trip as planned. There are some awesome camping spots in Alaska Basin and other areas outside of the park, so don't feel like you're missing out if you have to use this as an option. It's actually a really good way to string together a multi-day trip. My experience has been that the rangers are awesome and they'll do just about anything they can to make your trip happen for you. My suggestion to you is to have at least three different trip options planned and then a couple of flexible options within those trips so you can be as absolutely flexible as possible. That will give you the best chance of success when trying to get your permits. Now let's talk about parking. Parking is free and each trailhead has an area where you can park your vehicle while you're on your hike. There are multiple trailheads around the park and you'll have to select the one that corresponds with the trip that you'll be taking. Parking can be a real pain, especially during peak season. It is very, very busy in the Tetons with day hikers and sightseers galore. If you want a good parking spot, you'll have to get there early. My suggestion would be even as early as 7 a.m. Jenny Lake, for example, sometimes you can get there after 10 and there's literally no place to park whatsoever. The parking conditions vary from Jenny Lake, which actually has a paved road to it and a paved parking lot, to something like the Death Canyon Trailhead, where you're taking a dirt road for several miles and the road gets very, very rough toward the end. Here's a look at what the conditions were the last time we went. Here's a look at the Death Canyon road to the trailhead. It says four-wheel drive, recommended. We took a Honda Accord through here and we got to a certain point and we decided it was gonna be a little bit too rough for us. This is the part where we just figured we'd be better off to park and walk the rest of the way. It's pretty humpy. There's some water flowing through here. So we parked and now we're gonna walk, I don't know, maybe a half mile to the trailhead. Next, let's talk about bear safety. Black bears are common in the Grand Tetons, and there's a good chance that you'll see one. Luckily, black bears really don't care much for people and will probably pay no attention to you whatsoever. However, it is critically important that you keep your food away from the bears. Bear canisters are required and the rangers will check to make sure that you have one. Grizzly bears are also a possibility when backpacking in the Tetons. And whenever I'm in grizz country, I always have some bear spray with me and keep it handy. It's also a great idea to practice with it ahead of time so you know how to use it in case of an emergency. Next, let's talk about where to stay before and after your trip. You're gonna need at least one night before your trip. For example, if you got your permit on Monday morning, you're gonna start hiking Tuesday, you gotta stay somewhere on Monday night. If there's one piece of logistical advice I wish I had before I went out for the first time, it was this, where do I stay? There are a bunch of campgrounds in the area, 
They're all first come first serve and some of them fill up very early in the morning. Luckily, you can go to a website and check the average time these campgrounds have been filling up in recent days. The campground I prefer is called Grovant, and the reason I prefer it is because it's got the most sites and fills up latest in the day. Here's a look at the campsite we had on our most recent trip to Grovant. Here's a quick look at our campsite at Grovant. Got plenty of room. We've got three tents here, but you could probably pretty easily put four or five if you had to. Fire pit, picnic table, bear box, what more do you need? As you can see, some of the sites are a little bit exposed, but they do have bathrooms, they sell firewood, there's a little store there, and you have quite a bit of your own space. Overall, it's a pretty good place to stay. I mentioned earlier in the video that I was going to give you a list of stuff to do on the day you get your permit, and you've got pretty much a full day on your hands. So here we go. Number one is go to the Mormon house. This is just a short drive from the Grovant campground, and you've probably seen this before. It's just gorgeous and offers you a chance to get some great pictures. Next one is to visit Schwabacher's Landing. Now this is another great spot to take a walk and get some great photographs. If you go in the evening, which is my favorite time to go, the reflection on the still water of the stream is awesome and you get some great pics there. The next idea is to visit Jackson. The town of Jackson is just a short drive to the south and it's got a lot of stuff to do. You can go to the square, take pictures of the iconic antler arches. There's restaurants, ice cream shops, outfitters if you need any last minute gear. I'll admit parking can be a bit of a hassle when, the, when it's crowded, but I think it's well worth your time. The next one is, well, a little bit crazy, but if you're very adventurous, you could go to Yellowstone. It's a couple of hours away, but if you got a full day on your hands, uh, what's a few hours when you, can, when you can visit something as awesome as Yellowstone? Lastly, day hikes is another way to spend some time. There are tons and tons of trails in the area for you to stretch your legs and get warmed up for your big adventure that you're about to go on. Jenny Lake has a cool ferry that you can take across the lake and do some cool day hikes there. Also, you can walk around the lake if you want to as well. All in all, there are a ton of trails for you to visit on the day before your big hike. All right, last topic here before we wrap up. I'm just gonna share a couple of quick tips with you that I think you might find helpful. The first one is regarding your permit. I keep this thing very handy, like tied to the top of your backpack or in a pocket within easy reach. The rangers are all over the place in the park and you'll likely get asked to show your permit multiple times. It kind of stinks when you gotta take your backpack off and dig it out of the bottom somewhere, so just keep it handy in case that happens. The second tip is to keep your camera within easy reach. You'll likely see wildlife while you're on your trip and sometimes unexpectedly. If you keep your camera close at hand, you're better able to capture some of those moments. Here's a look at some of the things that we saw along our trip. Hey, that's my dinner over there. Thanks again for watching, and if you found any value in this video, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to my channel.